Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. The modern attack service is vast and permeable, extending from the data center to the cloud and device edge. Security teams are stretched thinner and thinner as they try to cover this ground. The result? More high-profile breaches hit the news every day. Don't let your organization be next. ExtraHop delivers security from the inside out, helping enterprise security teams detect threats up to 95% faster and cut staff time to resolve by two-thirds or more. Act with confidence. Learn more at extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Major data security breaches continue to make headlines. Are you prepared? Standardizing your security framework will help you stay competitive, be a reliable business partner, and manage intellectual property, financials, and employee and customer information. The American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, offers the standards you need in one place through standard subscriptions, a cost-saving, fully customizable solution. Sign up for your free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ANSI. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian. We've heard from our listeners that they love our content, but the amount of content we distribute can sometimes be a little overwhelming. We've recently released our customizable listener interest list. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and click the button to join the listener list and let us know your interests. Also, register for our upcoming webcast with ServiceNow by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. If you've missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, let's get into the leadership articles for this week. Yes. And I wanted to start with um, five ways to find natural leaders for your team. We need to do that. Yes. Well, that's why that's why I, I I brought this one up because I was like, oh, you know, we're in the middle of looking for a developer and and doing some hiring and and uh, hear that, folks. We like, are looking to hire a developer. So, <laughs> jobs at securityweekly dot com is the email address. Yeah, if you want to have fun like Paul Same. and I get to have every day in this great environment, then come on, join us. We got some we got some stuff to do. Um, but this is a great little article to talk about how to find leaders. Um, not only externally, but also internally, if you're looking to who are the going to be the natural leaders um, in your environment. And they break down these five, and I, I thought each one was kind of interesting to talk through a little bit. We'll spend a little extra time here because I think this is crucial for companies to find good leaders to help uh, grow the team and, and to grow your overall um, um, skills in the in an organization. So the first one was, Look for people with signs of high emotional intelligence. Now, so Matt, notice it. Matt, what is emotional yeah. intelligence? It, it's the ability to identify how people kind of feel. It's that em empathy side of the equation, yeah. right? So, as you're looking for a leader, it's not just about intelligence, but it's also about understanding what's what's deemed here emotional intelligence, and that is you understand how the rest of your team feels and you adjust your leadership mm. according to the needs of the team because you your em, em, empathy the em, empathic well, hopefully our team I, I agrees that we do a pretty good job of that i think we try we right try. And I mean, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we I get mean, it right 100 percent of the time but yeah like if you we see people struggling we we help and get them the resources they need and we know when to like back off and stay out of the way as the article described i think that's a good yeah to at least a very good example of two scenarios where your emotional intelligence comes into play. Sometimes you got to jump in and, and help, but sometimes you got to let them, let them do their thing. And you don't want to mix the two up, right? Because I, I think that's where most leaders get into trouble and jumping in and helping when like that's not what needed to be done at that moment. Exactly. And so understanding those situations and then applying the right decisions about help or not help is something that, that you should look for. And that creates a really good leader because they're looking out for the entire team and they're there to coach mm -hmm. the team at, at various um, 
you know, points in their career and personal life. I mean, aspects of this is, is also personal because there's a lot of external pressures, you know, your employees will get, your team gets as well. And understanding what's business related, what's personal related, which, which boundaries should you and shouldn't you cross are also very important there. True. The second one I love, because I agree with this one, look for brilliant communication skills. And this is a, something we, you know, we see a lot of great leaders have great communication skills. They do. They know how to communicate up and down the Mm -hmm. organization. And if you're looking for natural leaders in your organization, look for people that have great communication skills because it is, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's a dying skill, but if you look at where our where our social behaviors are going, we're Mm. less and less verbally written communicative, right? We, we, we interact a lot more on social media and other things and, and good communication skills have their place and will continue to have their place on your leadership team. You know, it's interesting. I I was talking to folks about hiring developers as we've, you know, just recently opened up a position for one and, you know, they tell me stories about, you can have some really brilliant software developers. However, they lack some of those communication skills and they'll talk to users and use, you know, terms like REST API or whatever. Uh, I say that because you had an article in there about REST and I thought we were going to talk about XML versus JSON, but it's actually about actual REST, not REST APIs. But um, so, you know, talking to the user is one thing. And then, this, you know, this person wants to move up in the organization, but, you know, they're in a meeting and they're on their phone texting or whatever during the meeting. And that was observed by others. And I think that really all kind of ties into communication skills. The, the other thing that's important with this developer um, specific examples, think about the requirements you're trying to articulate mm-hmm. to the developer, the developer understanding those to be able to ask questions and mm-hmm. understand, did they understand it correctly and be able to communicate back so that code is actually getting developed the right. way the you right want way. it to get developed. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's big. Very big. Number three is big potential, which is don't always judge a leader by their past. Mm -hmm. Look at what they could potentially do in the future. Now, obviously, you look at past performance as an indicator, but it's not the only indicator when looking for natural leaders. If, If you believe somebody has big potential and they just need to be given the opportunity that is a way to identify natural leaders in your organization as well. Yeah, and I was reading an article that talked about frustrations during the interview process. And one of the things it said that I thought was good general advice were questions during the interview process. If you're, like in our case, the employer, I'm asking the questions uh, to, of the interviewee is to ask questions about their past, Matt, and not like in this hypothetical situation, what would you do, right? try and say, you know, have you run into this situation before? And if they have, well, how did you handle it? Right. And have them talk about their skills and experiences that they bring to the table. And that doesn't necessarily have to relate precisely to the job. Like, you know, we list Python, but I'm like, if you know, you can probably learn it, right. It's not necessarily what we're looking for. Uh, it's a plus, but, uh, you know, when faced with a certain situation, how did you handle it in the past, regardless of, what technology platform it was on. So I think uh, in general, we get too hung up on what would you do and what specific skill sets do you have with technology when it should be more about asking them, how did you handle these various scenarios that were you encountered during your career or in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that helps you understand, do they have potential to do Mm. something outside of maybe what their past experience has been because they can adapt and grow and, and do more for you. Yep, absolutely. That and asking about specific skill sets, especially in security, is going to give you very few it, what you've defined as qualified candidates, in my opinion. Yeah. Number four, doers, not watchers. And, and I'm a big believer in this, right, is you want to see initiative. You want to see people really out doing the work, right? They see a problem, they're out trying to solve it. They're, mm-hmm. they're very active. They're not sitting back watching to see what other people do. Good leaders are doers. They're, they're just going to take the reins and they're going to go. They're not going to sit back and watch. I think it was John Strand and I were talking and he's like, you know, I enable my team to do stuff, 
because sometimes they feel like they're afraid to do stuff because they're going to make a mistake. And he's like, as long as you did something and you applied some kind of common sense to it, he's like, we're all good, right? So no harm, no foul. If you're trying stuff, taking initiative, applying some good common sense, you're not burning the infrastructure to the ground, right? You're, you're mindful of that. When you make a mistake, that's okay. We all make mistakes. Um, but having initiative is, is more important than I think the, the safer person that doesn't want to do anything because they're afraid to make a mistake, as an example. Right, which ties into our last one, which is accountability. We're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I've made plenty of mistakes in my career, sure. right? Me too. It's realizing that you've made the mistake, you acknowledge it, and then you decide how you're going to learn from it so you don't repeat it, right? Yep. So just to your point, you know, the conversations you had, uh, you know, with John, give them initiative. Mm. If they make mistakes, look, own up to it. Yep. If I have accountability for it, then I know that that person's not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And and so those two, the the doer and the accountability work hand in hand to really identify leaders that, one, have the initiative, realize when they make a mistake, learn from it, and get better for the long haul. Absolutely. Yeah. This was a good article. Anybody yeah, looking it. for leaders? I did. Yeah. I liked it. Uh, the second article, this is actually one of Jason's that he brought on for last week, but we did mm. the security money segment, so we didn't get to this one. And I brought this one in because it's a really interesting uh, correlation between uh, bomb squad experts and business. And I it just there's a couple points in here that I thought were just really interesting to review. The article is called Business Wisdom Learned from Bomb Squad Experts and Their Commanders. And... Basically, what the article talks about are there are three components to a bomb. You have, um, uh, what's the first one? It's called, um, the first component of any explosive device is its power source. Power source in business terms is the role that you're in. And a lot of what you have to think about in an, in an explosive and in business is, the power source or the role of the person in the, that has a major impact into how you think about uh, the problem is because that role and the, um, the, the responsibilities that that role has are a very important part. So they, they tie these different components of, of the explosive to uh, these different components in an organization, which I thought was interesting. So they, there's specific questions here. It says, what is the role situation specifically accountable for to ensure repeatable success? What is the precise business purpose of the role, event, or situation? What are the unambiguous boundaries of the role's functional responsibilities? And the, uh, this question's great because they do it all three times. When was the last time these questions have been asked and by whom? Hmm. That's a real thinker. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then they go into the second component and they say, well, the second component of a bomb is circuitry. And in business terms, that is the organization itself and aspects of the organization or the system that, that you're in, which means aspects of cultural influence and, and the organization as a whole, again, walks through these different questions to think about what's the role of the system here and how it will influence the outcome we want. What is the precise business purpose the system we're operating in has here? What are the system's unambiguous boundaries and how it will function here? And then again, when was the last time these questions were asked and by whom? Um, which leads into the third one, uh, which is the load, the explosive itself in, in the load. And here they refer to that as... Um, the, the performance capability of a person, right? So role, organization, and then the actual performance capability of that person based on those three and bringing those together. Um, again, looking at what's the accountable performance needed for success? What will the uh, precise business impact be in performing as needed? What are the unambiguous boundaries surrounding optimal performance? And then when was the last time these questions were asked and by whom? And, and so it puts these three components of, of bomb and bomb tax into a corollary into the business terms of the types of questions you should ask about the role, the organization, and the overall performance of that person in that role. It's, it's an interesting way to think about it. It yeah. is. 
That's pretty cool. And th- the best line in this article, by the way, is up towards the top. It says, if you see me running, mm-hmm. follow me. Yep. <laughs> every, every great bomb tech, I think, has that T-shirt, right? Yes. All right. Now we're going to get to rest and not rest APIs. Why rest is essential to high performance. Uh, I had to bring this article in. As some people know, I, I grew up in Ohio. I, I did a first part of my career in Cleveland. I went to school in Cleveland. And this is an interview with LeBron James, who's no longer with the Cavs. He's now in L.A. But it talks about the need for high performers to get adequate amount of rest. Now, most people would hear you know, seven to nine hours. This actually talks about some of these athletes, nine, 10 hours of rest a a night needed to refuel Mm. their body for high performance. But the article talks about this isn't only just a physical need. It's also mental to help with creativity. The mind needs time to rest. And a lot of entrepreneurs, sometimes me included, um, wouldn't get a lot of rest, right? We're just constantly on the go, 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 go. This article really talks about how rest is important uh, for the mental state of the person as well as the physical state and how getting more sleep actually helps with creativity and innovation and some of the other um, pr- kind of the things we want to see out of our leaders. Yeah, totally agree. Not always a reality in my world, but uh, I have small kids at home, so... That makes it hard, (laughs) harder, I should say, uh, to get rest. Um, But even just not thinking about it, putting it down for a while, putting your project down for a while uh, is, you know, huge. In fact, the coding project I'm working on, right? Friday, I was stuck on a problem. And I'm like, I'm going to work on other things over the weekend. Uh, Came in Monday morning. And within like 20 minutes, I had had figured out that that particular problem. and so sometimes just stepping away, I was one of the things that when I worked my first job uh, in college in technology that the support person, Dave, taught me was sometimes you just got to not think about it and come back to it and then you'll have a fresh perspective on it. And I think rest is a similar kind of kind of thing, right? Yeah. And it talks about that in this article. It says four hours of highly productive work is better than eight hours yes. of um, interrupted work, for mm-hmm. example. And how 12-hour workdays aren't really more effective because Mm -hmm. you need to take those breaks. You need to walk away from aspects of the work that's in front of you because it gives your your mind time to rest. Think about the problem maybe a little differently to come back and solve it to your point, right? And so they, they talk about how these different day structures also impact aspects of rest and how sometimes you just, you need to take those breaks during the day to to give your mind time to catch up and, and think about things differently. For sure. Yeah. That's a good article. Um, I try to get that sleep as much as I can, but mm-hmm. it's always hard and it will be really difficult on a red eye tonight <laughs> coming yes. into the studio. So yes. <laughs> we'll see how well I think tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, this next article is four ways working dads can make more time for family. And I don't want to only, cause look, I think there's a lot of working moms out there that, this article applies to as well. Um, so I, I don't want anybody to take it as, as a, a one sided only because I think there's some really good tips in here. And this is something I've had to learn over the years. I've traveled a, a lot in my career over the years. When, when we moved to Colorado in 2004, early on, I had my startup here, which was a spin out from Acuvant, and I spent a lot of time at work. And then you know, as my career progressed, I worked for companies that weren't based in Colorado. I was on a lot of airplanes over the years. So, you know, this article is kind of near and dear to my heart a little bit because I've been here. I've, I've gone through this, right? And there's certain um, things that my wife and I did when I was home to really impact the time at home aspects of my career. And and they're summarized in here. And that's why I wanted to bring these up because I think they're really important for anybody, uh, any parent that works a lot or travels a lot. These are the things, some of the things that have helped me get through this in my career. First one, make time for the little things. And when I mean little things, I mean simply every morning, as Paul knows, my calendar's blocked out because I take my son to school, my youngest. 
I drive them to the Air Force Academy every morning that I'm home. That's just one of the things I do with him, right? That time in the car is precious. So that's kind of my first start of my day is I take my son to school. Um, I try to pick him up every night uh, from baseball practice because now he's in baseball. I try to pick him up after practice. I try to get to every single baseball game when I'm home, right? Those are the little things we're talking about because they have a huge impact on your relationship with your children. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I dedicate and block those times out on my calendar. Absolutely. Yeah. That, you do the same thing. Good. Yeah. You got you to gotta be involved and use your calendar to block off those little things. Um, all the ta- taking kids to school and driving around, being the chauffeur, right? Uh, yeah. You know, my, my boys are involved with all kinds of activities and I try and, uh, you know, be there and have it on my calendar. You see me leaving early some days, pick my son up from here, drop my son off, you know, other son off there. That's important. Agreed. Yeah. The other thing I do is when we're home, we always have dinner as a family together. We don't eat at different times. We all eat together. Even if that's I'm 7 o'clock that. at night. It's hard when they're little because they don't care about eating. <laughs> right? I know. Yeah, it's hard. I, well, think it's that, hard. I think that gets better as your kids get, get older with dinner time for sure. Yeah, mine are older. But, you know, it, it varies every day. Mm-hmm. Some nights he has baseball, so we'll eat at a normal time. But on a night he's got a baseball game, we may not eat until 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Right. But we'll all get together and eat together. Again, the other thing that, that I do too is like whenever my sons ask me to like stop what I'm doing and have a lightsaber duel or go play soccer in the yard, I just do it, right? Like, and I think it, the article talks about the you know, priority uh, and sense of urgency for things, right? Correct. Whatever you're doing at the time probably can wait and you can go play with your kids, right? That, and I, yeah. I'm a nerd and, you know, when they ask me to do things like watch Star Wars or have lightsaber duels, I'm all about it, so... <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, that ties into the second point. Know what's truly urgent mm-hmm. and be able to know what's urgent that you need to deal with and what's not urgent. So again, I'm not allowed to have my cell phone at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. My wife is banned it. Yep. Don't look no at, I'm not allowed to look yep. at the phone. Yeah. Uh, because look, if it's urgent, okay. But in most cases, what we do, it can wait. Yep. You know, my wife is a nurse. You know, your wife's in the healthcare space. Mm-hmm. They know what urgent is. When oh, yeah. somebody's life is on the line, mm-hmm. that's urgency. I don't. We don't have anything like that on our side no. that is that urgent where we're talking life and death. And mm-hmm. so just understand what's truly urgent, what's not. And those things that aren't urgent, they can wait. Yep. They can wait until later when the kids are in bed. They can wait until the next morning sometimes. And yep. it's understanding those. Yeah, and I think that morning work time is better than night work time, as the article kind of outlines too. Yep. Uh, it talks about setting boundaries. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this already. You know, one of my boundaries is, uh, no electronics at the dinner table. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But you got to set those boundaries and you got to figure those things out. Right. I mean, it's, it's hard to raise kids. And when you have working parents, it, it, you know, there's a lot of boundary setting that helps just kind of keep you all focused in aspects of the routines. And it's, it's not only good for you, it's, and your spouse, it's good for your kids too. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is set some goals. And, and we're not talking like work goals, like, okay, I got to, you know, so much in revenue or this, that, and the other thing, but it's little things like, all right, my goal is when we're home, we all have dinner together. That means seven nights a week, we should be having dinner together. You know, how many baseball games am I going to get to practices, whatever those little goals are, set some goals and, and make sure that you're spending the time, with your kids, with the family, with the spouse, um, it goes a long way. And it's taken, like I said, it, it took Lauren and I a long time to figure it out. It, it took does, us a, yeah. a few good years to figure this it's out. It's a great point, Matt. This is nothing that you can read an article and like all of a sudden turn things around, in my opinion. It just it takes a lot of work, a lot of communication, a lot of trial and error, too. It does. And, you know, and those things and, change, right? The kids' schedules change, the wife's schedule change, the work schedule changes, as in my case, changes quite a bit, right? And so you, you got to be kind of fluid, which is hard uh, for me, it's especially I like to know that I'm doing the same thing every week. Hence, Security Weekly has been on a Thursday night for 14 years or whatever. Right. Um, yep. But you got to you got to learn to be flexible. Yeah, agreed. And you got to work closely with your spouse to do it because the yeah. two of you got to be partners in this. And, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, we figured it out, but it took us a while to get there. Yeah. And so we're. Uh, insights into the way things are going at home for me we're getting ready to put in a new septic tank it looks like so 
my, my wife and I just we just keep telling each other more me telling her like we're gonna work together on this there's a lot of things to be done right to support this some things got to get put on hold but there's no way one of us could you know take on even 80 percent of this right like we have to split responsibilities uh so I'm gonna be working from home for sometimes right while there's excavators driving through my yard and stuff like that uh, ripping but, up tile yeah, and all the fun it's a it's a team effort for sure yes definitely all right a couple uh little technology tidbits in here uh gartner shift to public cloud curbs data center uh data center spending now we've talked about this we even mm -hmm. in the last segment with adam right mm -hmm. moving to the cloud but what's that impact on budgets and that's what i saw thought was pretty interesting in this article there's some really good metrics in here for anybody who wants to see them gartner talks about forecasts that global it spending will hit 3.79 trillion in 2019 which is an increase of 1.1%. So the first thing to take away from that is if you're in the security space, remember a lot of our budgets are tied to our IT budgets. Mm. Um, and it's usually a fraction of, of this number. But when you see the increase to 1.1%, that, that just tells me that IT spending might be might be getting a little flat here. 1.1% uh, is not a big increase on a year-by-year -year basis. But in contrast, it predicted a 2.8% decline in spending on data center equipment, which is, which is big, right? As, as Even though spending's going up, data, spending, data center spending's going down because people are starting to shift assets into the cloud. And this will also have, I think, an impact on security spend, which mm -hmm. is where are you spending for security solutions you if you're not putting in as much data center equipment you're not putting in on-premise security solutions to protect that right. equipment yep yeah, yeah. so and very think, you know yeah the shift is is interesting but i think expected by many of us right and a lot of the newer security companies we're seeing are very much in the cloud and you have the other article in here about three factors to ensure a successful shift to the cloud. I was just catching up with Cloud Needy, uh, who is a sponsor, Matt and I are advisors. Uh, this is a technology, that, an area that I look at, I'm like, this could really ease, I think put a lot of people at ease about shifting to the cloud, right? It's gonna tell you whether you're in compliance or not when your stuff is in the cloud. It's gonna tell you if you've set a way that you're deploying an application or infrastructure to the cloud, that it matches that, and if it doesn't, it's going to tell you about it. The cloud providers, I think, have done a pretty terrible job at giving us that visibility. And when you have vendors like Cloud Needy, they can give you that information. Uh, and I think, uh, especially in your initial migration, it's huge. I mean, when I've done IT projects, my biggest question is like, what did I miss, right? Like, what didn't I configure that was there before that needs to be now and might look different? I mean, if that doesn't describe your move to the cloud, uh, you know, it, it should, right? And having those checks and balances is important. Yeah, I mean, with the previous article and this one, right, which is the kind of the three steps to cloud migration, I've been telling the investment community for a while because I do a lot of mm -hmm. advisory calls for them. I'm like, guys, this is happening. And the, the reason I brought this article in is because it's the first time someone has actually documented a decline in data center mm -hmm. equipment spending. And to me, that's the tip of the iceberg of what is going to transpire over the next few years. And so how do you then as a security professional get ready for this continual shift away from on-premise data center equipment into the cloud, and which ties into this next article in, in the conversation on cloud needy is, look, the, the, the security walls have shifted. Mm -hmm. Not are they only shifting, they have shifted. And we talk about this move of the perimeter away from the, the network and how it's moving to the application and the user because applications and users are no longer inside your four walls mm -hmm. as a corporation and those walls are shifting every day. If you think a traditional firewall is a stopgap control for you, it, it's not in the long term because everything's moving outside of the perimeter. Um, so that that's one of the, the, the points in the second article here. The other one is the cloud will add flexibility, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. I think it, we have to think about from security professionals. It's great for the development teams to be able to spin up their own stuff, but is it configured correctly? Is it compliant? Is it secure? 
yeah, that flexibility is great for your development team and for the business to be agile and, and move faster, but it puts a lot more burden on the security teams to make sure things are secured and configured correctly. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then the last one is on the cloud, you can scale up. Again, good and bad. Cost-wise, it allows... could be bad, which is why yeah. there's companies like Cloud Checker and the like to give you a handle on your costs. Exactly right. And that's why I think not only will you see a continual move to the cloud, but I think you will see a continual cloud uh, move not only to infrastructure as a service, but ultimately to platform as a service where you are less and less reliant on the in underlying infrastructure yourself and you're leveraging a platform because the, the cost dynamics are better there. And you don't have to worry about managing the individual infrastructure, which is why I see this abstraction of the network and the endpoint continuing, um, moving more to the user and the application, because we're going to be deploying these applications on platforms, mm -hmm. not on dedicated infrastructure in the cloud anymore. Yep. Sweet. So some good tips. All right. That's our articles for the week. So I want to thank everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.